All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my screen up here. Uh, thanks for the uh, for the nice introduction, Frank. Um, appreciate uh, you know saying the nice things, and certainly been been friends for a long time, and um, and worked together for a number of those years. Um, you know, I'm certainly excited to present uh, my perspective today. Um, before I do that, um, I know it's redundant, but it's certainly going to be necessary to to thank a few people here. Um, with uh, obviously the PBS CCS board and the education committee for, you know, the opportunity to, to speak and present, you know, my thoughts today. Uh, also want to congratulate Matt on, uh, on being named the administrative director for the PBS CCS. And, you know, this is another really positive uh, step forward for, for this group. And, and frankly, one that, that I think is, is it's about time that we have because it's necessary. Uh, also want to recognize the work of, you know, James Clifford and Kiyoshi, uh, Scott Weberg, certainly Nate Shaw for putting together this, this education uh, today, and, uh, and Frank, obviously your work behind the scenes. And then finally, uh, absolutely necessary to congratulate, you know, BMAC on, on being named, um, you know, the new president of, of the group here, um, certainly put in his time and, and well-deserving there, and, and Trung, congratulations on um, on being uh, named strength coach of the year. Uh, so certainly some, a lot of good things going on in this organization that I'm um, like, you know, Jose and, and Rob mentioned, I'm certainly proud to be a part of this, you know, today. Um, so, you know, about six weeks ago, Nate Shaw and I were, were talking and he asked me to present and, and we landed on um, the evolution of, of the strength coach role. And, you know, over the past 20 years, baseball has really been good to me and afforded me, you know, a lot of opportunities and given myself and my family really so much. Um, and we're certainly thankful for that with the experiences and, and the people that, that we've met, the network that we've built. Um, and so I'm really excited to, um, to share about my experience and my experiences uh, and hope that they can be some, provide some value um, to, to people that are, you know, are watching and, and just give a little bit of my perspective. Uh, in terms of my current professional direction, uh, I've recently taken a position with, with the U.S. Army as an H2F director or the Holistic Health and Fitness Director, uh, working with the 20th Engineer Brigade. Uh, this will be based uh, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which is the, the largest uh, base uh, for the Army there. Um, and uh, the job is going to come with, uh, with a new set of challenges to my career, and, and my family and I are, are super excited about this new direction and, and what it'll bring. So in terms of an overview, what I plan to cover today is really highlighting the fact that the professional baseball strength coach role has, has evolved. And uh, I've seen that happen over the last 20 years. Um, a valuable first step in understanding how that's happening, how that's happened is reflecting on experiences followed by identifying and then responding to the change or what we've seen change. So in this presentation, I'll explain how the role has evolved during my career. I plan to share the lessons that I've learned and discuss the future of the strength coach role. So getting specific on, on objectives, um, I think about this is, you know, what, what do I want the audience to take away or what do I want you to know that I'm gonna talk about, you know, up front. Um, and the first is, you know, what is, what is my career experience? And I'll begin by laying some groundwork about my experience. Talk about places that I've worked, how long I've worked there, what roles have I held, and talk about what I learned during those parts of my career. These experiences are responsible for shaping my perspective or my viewpoint on the topic and ultimately explaining the decisions that I've made over my career. And that'll really provide some context towards, towards these, next four, uh, these next four bullets. Um, the next is advancements in the role or how has this role changed over time? How has the strength coach role changed over time? And I've been, you know, been fortunate to observe advancements in the role over time and really similar to other career fields some of the changes are positive, while others, I'm not going to say are negative, I'm just saying say that they provide challenges for us. What's important is to recognize them so that we can plan for the future. So I'll talk about how I've seen specific roles and responsibilities of the strength coach change over time. Number three is what are the foundations or known as like linchpins? What are the things that are holding this together? And the same can be said for foundations or linchpins that we follow. They're necessary components and building blocks of the field and they've survived over time. 
I'll identify four key foundations that have sustained regardless of the change or the evolution that we've seen. This, these are places that are worthwhile to invest your time, energy, and effort learning about because they're definitely gonna be here to stay. Uh, number four here, what lessons have I learned? I've personally learned many lessons over my career from a variety of experiences and definitely people and mentors involved in that process. These have surfaced from experiencing some success, but also making a ton of mistakes and having some failure to deal with. I'll share a few of my main takeaways uh, so that when you face these challenges, it may highlight some places for you to consider. And finally, future opportunities. What should I expect in the future? Our world in this field are changing rapidly, and we've certainly seen that in 2020 with COVID-related uh, adjustments. Um, and we've seen this, you know, however, we have many of the same problems from basic communication to changing or learning about others' perspectives. What I know for sure is that these will continue to be industry problems until we identify tangible solutions. So I'll talk about four places to invest your time that can improve your effectiveness moving forward. So where does this all begin for me? Uh, as, a, as a young kid, uh, definitely was in, into sports and into baseball. Uh, I did have a dream, you know, as a, as a child to, you know, to, to make it to the major leagues as, as a baseball player. But, you know, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the talent to do that. Played through, uh, you know, high school and into, into uh, college and played at a junior college. And what I started to recognize was, like I said, I, I wasn't going to make it to the major leagues at, as a player. And I started to learn about uh, strength and conditioning related um, things that I could do that would elevate my game uh, to be able to, to perform at really a similar level as, as others. So I started spending time learning about, you know, lifting and, and conditioning, recovery, sleep, and piecing these together. And ultimately, you know, how did they, how did they add to my performance every day? And while others were being forced to do these things through some really novel strength and conditioning at that time, um, I took it pretty seriously and, and it became a passion for me in terms of maintaining my health and, and really working to, um, to perform at that high level that I could that was for me. Um, and ultimately, you know, ended up following this strength and conditioning path that in 2008, I was able to, to make it to the major leagues with the Los Angeles Dodgers. And, and really this helped me achieve, um, you know, a, a really a lifetime goal since I was just a little boy and trying to figure out, you know, how do I, how do we get to the major leagues and, and what does that look like? Um, I'm going to provide a little bit more context here and, and sort of break up my, my path or my experience into three different sections. And I think about um, really this being, for simplicity's sake, really kind of like at the beginning, where was I spending my time? What did my experience look like? Um, Moving on to this middle phase, which I think about is where I was kind of establishing uh, my work at the major league level. Um, and then third is my most recent experience and, and what have I learned during that time. So where does this begin for me? Really, this, this first um, seven year period here is about really establishing and, and earning some experience. Um, in 2001, in the summer of 2001, I was, uh, I was studying at the University of Kansas. Um, I have an older brother who's, who's been a, a scout in baseball for a long time, who um, happened to be working for the Royals and knew Jim Malone. Um, Jim Malone was the minor league coordinator with the Kansas City Royals at that time. Uh, the AA affiliate, the Wichita Wranglers, had their strength coach leave, uh, took another opportunity, and Jim Malone called and said, you know, I know you're, you're currently working with, uh, with the University of Kansas as a volunteer assistant. You know, would you be willing and, and open to, uh, to come in and fill in for a, for a few weeks with the Wichita Wranglers? Um, and so I did that. Now, one unique thing about that is uh, at the time, the WBC or the, the NBC tournament, excuse me, was being held uh, at, uh, at the Wichita Wranglers Stadium. And, and for those that aren't aware, that's basically a 24 hour college tournament that goes on for three weeks. So my first experience to professional baseball um, was getting on a, a bus and being on a 21 day road trip right out of the gate and getting to know the Texas League uh, at the age of 21. So quite, a, um, quite an eye opener for me um, because obviously I had no experience doing that. The next year, um, 
there was a there was a listing. I had just finished uh, my collegiate uh, work, and um, there was a listing with Colorado Rockies with Brian Jordan, short season uh, opportunity that that was available in in Pasco or Tri Cities, Washington. Um, he invited me to to take that opportunity. Um, again, I was on a on a flight down to Tucson for the, the back end of extended spring training at that time. Spent seven days there, had no idea what I was doing, and then I was off to to Pasco, Washington, with with the uh, short season um, Dust Devil team there. And and as I recall and kind of think about this period, I would have to say it it might be one of the most fulfilling uh, seasons of my career. Um, and the reason I say that is is because you know you're at the time you're getting uh, new college players into the organization. And really what was good about it is the amount of coaching and teaching that I was forced to do uh, with, with onboarding these new players was super fulfilling because, you know, these young guys were, were really excited to, um, you know, to get on board and they'd just been drafted and it was such a great experience for them. So, you know, my time there was, was really, was really excellent and, and learned a lot. Um, I can remember, you know, spending most of my morning trying to schedule out my, you know, what I was going to do with players. And, and one of the biggest lessons that I learned was like, at first I had planned out 21 days and maybe up to a month right out of the gate. And like, you know, it third day in rain day. And so the entire schedule was, was thrown off. And so I learned like, you got to have a, a basic idea, but at the same time, you don't want to script too far away because it will change. In the, uh, the winter of 2002, um, <clears throat> I had applied for uh, trying to get in as a, as a full-time strength coach someplace with a full season team, uh, had applied to uh, the Cleveland Indians um, and received a phone call from Joe Hughes uh, late in, uh, in 2002. And he said, hey, we, we'd love to have you come join our, our, our team next year. This was also the, the same year that Tim Maxey had taken over with, uh, with the Cleveland Indi Indians. So I was off to, you know, to get a uh, better understanding of that. And really in 2003, had my first experience going to spring training and, and everything that comes with that and meeting new people. And, you know, you're waking up at you know, whatever time, 4, 4, 30, 5 o'clock, depending on whether you train or not in the mornings. And, um, and then at the end of the day, spending quite a few hours on the computer trying to organize for the next day. And so, you know, 2003, I had the chance to, to work double A with the Cleveland Indians in, um, in Akron, Ohio. I went to uh, Buffalo, triple A at that time for, for the Indians in 2004, and then back to Akron in 2005. And that same year, the Indians relocated um, my wife and I uh, to the Akron area. So I spent three years uh, as a minor league strength coach there with a the full season team and really, um, I think, started to understand what is the, what's the rhythm look like and what, is this, um, what kind of work has to be done during the workday. Uh, on my way to spring training in, in 2005, uh, I had intentions on going back to, um, to AA for a second consecutive season and was pulling into the, the Holiday Inn um, in Winter Haven, uh, to, which was the team hotel or whatever for spring training. And uh, at that time, John Farrell was the, the farm director, got a phone call from him and he said, hey, you know, Jim Malone's taken the, the major league strength coach job with the San Diego Padres. Uh, we'd love to, to offer you that role. So um, I had intentions on being a double A strength coach, pulled into the hotel and all of a sudden I was the minor league coordinator. And I can remember, you know, thinking, all right, well, here we go. Like I, I got to bring my best game. And um, I probably went into the office that night and tried to figure out how I was going to pull this off. But um, <laughs> really, you're not ready till you are. And, and I didn't have a choice and it was, it was awesome. So 2006, 2007, um, you know, minor league coordinator for, for Cleveland, uh, also had the chance to, um, you know, to work with Tim Maxey in the major leagues quite a bit. So uh, it got a little bit of major league exposure as well. So zooming out during these seven years, what are some things that I learned? And um, the first was really just getting started and trying to establish myself. Um, just jumping in, didn't matter where it was. Um, you know, I filled in for 21 days or whatever, almost a month. And then the next year is working a short season and finally um, kind of caught on with, with Cleveland. But really, you know, for a young strength coach, just get going. Uh, number two is really learning about being fluent with things like Microsoft Excel. 
um, you know, train heroic and bridge were, were not the standard or the norm at, at that time. And if you're going to scale training efficiently, you're going to have to learn how to, to use Excel well. And, um, and those skills are, are still relevant today as, as some strength coaches are still hesitant to adopt uh, some of these new technologies. Number three was implementing a program. It's the idea of taking someone else's ideas and sponsoring them. And I think we're, we're all good at having our own ideas. I think where the challenge comes is saying, your job right now is to implement others, others' ideas and, and vision and values until you later get the chance to do that on your own. Number four, the Colorado Rockies were really big and Brian was big at, at the time on, on strength coaches conditioning with the pitchers and position players. And, and at that time I was unsure why I was doing that. And I got on board and said, sure, no problem, I'll do that. But what I realized was it really wasn't about just running with the players or, or you know, anything like that. What it was about was participating with them and going along with them and, and engaging in, in some of the experiences or struggles that they may or may not have been having. And so really um, it's about just jump in with those guys and, and be a part of, of what they're doing. Um, so that's what I learned there with the Rockies. Next is staff relationships. You know, at times we can, as strength coaches, we can think that, that our programming is, is amazing or whatever, but at the end of the day, this is about baseball. This is about working back, backwards from baseball. You know, what we do as strength coaches supports that. And, and in order to make that happen, your relationships with staff have to be strong and you have to be able to work backwards to help them get what they want and ultimately the players. Next is the in-season daily rhythm. You know, you have to get used to what, what it feels like to be tired really all the time in season, um, to wake up to the 10 o'clock um, gym on the road, to having that 30 to 45 minutes back at the hotel on the road before you get on the bus to then go to the stadium. And, you know, you're not getting home till midnight or whatever. And if you still have work to do on the computer, then you do. And you kind of have to get used to waking up and doing this all over again. Next is seeing the big picture because I had worked um, a short season then all the way to, up to the major leagues with Tim just as an assistant, no significant role there, but I had seen the bigger picture from what it looked like from, from you know, the short season team to double, triple A, and then all the way up to the big leagues. And it gave me a, a different perspective. And finally, I began to accumulate my, my experience to later develop my philosophy. So this was a time period where I was really gathering information I figured out later, like, hey, I really hope I get the chance to put some things in play on my own. But um, really, I was just gathering and piecing together my philosophy at this time. In this middle phase of my career, really, um, 2008 was a, was a really big year um, because I was able to, to get the Major League Strength Coach job with, uh, with the Dodgers. Um, I was at uh, Fall Instructional League with the Indians late in 2007, got a phone call. Um, Los Angeles Dodgers are, are interviewing for Major League Strength Coach role. Um, ended up flying out there for a three or four day interview, which was uh, very thorough and excellent. A lot of really great discussion and um, some agreement, some disagreement, but really positive in terms of, um, of learning what that was going to be about. Um, so spent spent four years as the major league strength coach with the Dodgers. And, and this is a time where I started to get involved in more earnest with the PBS CCS. And so um, in 2011 uh, was my first of, of four total years as the PBS CCS secretary. Um, but just zooming out in terms of my time in LA, um, obviously exposure to the, to the big market club was, was different and there's a lot that comes with that. But this is also a time I started to get a bit more curious about data and information. Um, and started to collect probably more subjective than objective data, um, mainly because of the availability of technology. But you know, during this time period, really was taking um, interest in in learning about information, data, and how could I, you know, how could I push this back to the players so that we could make better decisions together, ultimately to to make better baseball players. Um, late in in 2011, was approached by the front office for the. Uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, they were rebuilding at the time and, and had asked, um, you know, we'd love to have you come join Pittsburgh Pirates as the Major League Strength Coach. Um, I did that in 2012, all the way through 15. So four full seasons with the Pittsburgh Pirates um, as a Major League Strength Coach. Uh, I mentioned my time as the secretary, but also um, I transitioned from the sec secretary to the president role in 2015, where I served uh, for, for four years um, in that role. 
And as I think back about um, my time with the Pirates, uh, the I began to sort of get take my curiosity a bit further because tour, uh, technology tools were becoming more available. And so tools like Zephyr um, were starting to be used, and and we you know we started using that. And um, it really the the first step to learning how to train athletes or you know program or anything is is really understanding like what are the demands of the game and and a tool like Zephyr really gave us the chance to quantify the demands of the game by position and so that was awesome because now we could start adjusting you know our programming and and understanding about the the physiological demands uh, of the sport um, and uh, that was a really big turning point for us and so um, we did things like modifying warm-up routines for all players making sure that you know, what we we're asking them to do was directed towards what the demands um, of the game were. And uh, we did quite a bit of work with, um, with the starting pitchers, conditioning models. You know, it had been pretty traditional post-pitching during spring training. Guys come out there, run pulls. Um, that may or may not be the best way to do it. What we decided to do was to start matching in-game heart rate data with their, with their post-pitch conditioning. And so what that looked like was, you know, shorter bursts um, and shorter bouts of rest to maintain higher heart rates for, for um, you know, five five to seven minutes or whatever. And um, we thought that was effective at that time. Um, and then even further, just with the accelerometer data, um, you started to pay attention. We started to pay attention to things like swings and and things like that for position players. So really, we're thinking about bringing this all together. Um, at this time period, um, it really, it was also a good chance um, for me to understand sort of the dichotomy between this big market concept and a smaller market team um, and what was going with that. And, and I wouldn't say that either one is better or worse. I would say that, that, um, that they're both difficult and they both have a big advantage in terms of, in terms of learning. Um, you know, with, with the Dodgers really got a, a view of kind of what comes with, uh, with big market you know, expectations and, and then with the Pirates got a, got a sense for, you know, what comes with um, having to use every dollar of the budget and, and maintaining, you know, your work to be on the front end of new technologies and, and things. So neither one of them is better or worse. Um, they're both really great opportunities and, and come with different learning points. So my first takeaway during, during this, um, this eight years was really getting my first major league experience. Most of my experience before this time I'd had, didn't have to answer the, the difficult questions from, from front office or leadership, uh, but this is really my time where people were asking me those questions, not people above me. Um, I was able to apply and then refine my, my personal philosophy where the, the first stage in my beginning part of my career, that was about gathering information and gathering my thoughts about what I would do later. Well, this was a time period I got to actually put those things in play. We started doing things with things like the activation program, sort of create, creating that program. Uh, we noticed players wanted to come in and they wanted to do some type of prep work. It seemed unstructured and inefficient. And, and we took that as an opportunity to begin structuring out um, two, two things, really overall general concepts that work for most everyone. And then also individual activation pieces and layering that together uh, to make really efficient warm up prep programs. Um, next is 50%. When I left LA, went to the Pirates, um, I really didn't know how many new challenges uh, were going to be ahead, and really 50% of of what we were doing with uh, with the with the Dodgers, um, only about 50% of that worked with going to the Pirates. And the reason that that exists is, like, you have a whole new set of challenges. You've got a whole new um, group of people, different players, and um, really some of it will work, but recognizing that not all of it will. Um, new network of people. Uh, what I realized after I'd been in a few organizations was every time you go to a new organization, you're meeting about 100 new staff members and probably 250 new players. And what a great opportunity to, to develop new relationships and, and form those um, lasting relationships, with, which I feel like I've done. And, um, and later on, that becomes really valuable uh, for your career as you're problem solving or trying to, to, uh, to learn new ways to do things. Um, finally, Around this time, it had been common for things like activation, running, lifting, monitoring, 
volume and load management and recovery process to be dealt with almost in silos or like independently. But this was a time where we started to think about those working as a system and how, how would one impact the other and what adjustments did we need, need to make you know, to one more than the other. So um, really kind of learned more about how do these systems interplay with each other. And moving on to the third phase, which is my most recent experience, has to do with two different roles. Uh, 2016 to 18, um, I was uh, the sports science coordinator for, for the Pittsburgh Pirates, moved out of the major league strength coach role, um, and, uh, and finished up my tenure as, as the president in, um, uh, in 2018. Um, and then 2019 to 2020, which is my most recent experience, uh, director of performance science with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And I think about this phase as sort of just being brave enough to step out of what I'd always done as a strength coach. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, I'd been curious about data and how to apply this. And, and uh, in 2016, Kyle Stark said, hey, you know, um, who was assistant general manager at the time, said, come and, you know, give this, want you to give this role a shot and really try to grow this in the organization. And, and so I did that um, and really learned about, you know, how do I start talking about data more than I was? And and helping strength coaches and, and maybe leadership and different personnel think about that as well. Um, in, in 2019 and 2020, the last two years, what distinguishes that role from director of performance science role from the sports science coordinator role is really the, the width that I was covering as, as a, in a director role. So I was now spending time in talent identification and selection between the Dominican Republic uh, and even in homes prior to the draft in June. Um, I was also spending time if in development uh, at the major league level with optimization um, and then seeing which pieces would, would work or not to bring into our system. So really like covering a, a wider range of, uh, of work than I was uh, with the sports science coordinator, mainly focusing in on um, internal player development. So what did, I, what did I learn during this final phase or the final five years of my time in baseball? First is leading a new and unestablished space. Um, when I took the sports science coordinator role, there certainly were, were other people practicing that type of work within baseball. However, that type of role wasn't commonplace in the game and there were no guardrails, much like strength and conditioning had created over the previous 20 or 30 years. And so really there were no rules. So the only rules that that existed were the ones you were creating for yourself. And, and this is, makes it difficult in some respects and easier in some others. Um, but that was, that was a big change at that time. Um, responding to technology challenges, as many of you guys, you guys and gals may recall, we had some um, restructuring of items like technology consent uh, between the league, the union and, and clubs. Um, there were some, certainly some, some challenges to that. However, what I would say is that it's, uh, it's forced us to, to adapt and, and move forward. And we probably learned as much as, as we could out of that situation. I mentioned that I'd done some work, um, you know, some really some wider work between selection, development, optimization, um, but really it, it changed my, my view of how that system of, of player development worked. I think also at this time, we saw analytics beginning to provide real value. Um, and the reason I say that is, is a few things. The first is that the data that we were getting was much better than the data that's been collected to this point. So we had really clean information coming in. I think the other point that I'd like to make is that for the longest time, strength coaches were the ones doing the work with the data. And although that worked for some time, we're not trained in mathematics or statistics. And so having real uh, data analyst experts coming into our space um, and helping us answer questions that we have or, uh, or providing guidance to, to how we might um, move forward in some other areas provided really significant value at this time. And then finally, um, this phase gave me a chance to, to live my philosophy, lead others in learning more about wider systems in previous times in my career, I was either, you know, figuring out what my philosophy was or, or putting in play, but this time it was more just about just living what you believed um, more than anything. So to sum this up, um, 20 years of, of time committed in the game, worked for five organizations, two in the last 13 years, uh, I've held five roles 
as a minor league strength coach, five years um, as a coordinator, major league strength coach, uh, three years as sports science coordinator, two as director of performance science. Um, relocated three times, three different cities, twice in the last 13 years. So we've been fortunate. Uh, we've been in Pittsburgh the last nine years, um, been pretty stable here. Um, have, uh, have given eight years of the PBS CCS, four secretary, four as the president. And the reason that I bring this up is it highlights one important point, I think, as I think about this, is that, you know, early in your career, you're really going to have to do a lot for a little. Um, and what that means is you're going to have to really hustle, and it doesn't feel like you're going to get much back. But what's most important is that you hustle during this time if you have intentions of having different or maybe um, moving upwards as you go forward. Um, and it's really difficult to, to understand at first, but just keep going. If, if you're a young strength coach, just keep going continue to accumulate experience and, um, and really things can, will move forward. So getting on to how has the role changed? And I've listed four things here that I'll, that I'll go over. Um, another way to say this is how have we advanced? And the first is that strength coach value has increased. Strength conditioning has existed for a long time and the, and the profession has progressed um, in the last 20 years to increase our value. We've worked to continually improve our image, improve our leadership in the industry. Here are a few tangible examples of our advancement. Number one, number of full-time roles have increased. And in fact, the full-time employment is now the norm as opposed to a unique approach taken by one or two organizations who were piecing together full-time work. Number two is our minimum standard credentials have been created to ensure competence in our area. We now have governance by the NSCA and their relevant credentials like the CSCS and RSCC programs. In support of applying sports science best practices to performance, the NSCA will soon release a sports science credential and strength coaches certainly should take advantage of that too. Number three, the availability of overall certifications has increased. It's not uncommon to have additional credentials like the FMS, FRC, SFMA or equivalents that these are, are coming uh, coming up because strength coaches are, are, have demand for those. Number four, organizations have increased resources towards areas that support strength coaches work like sport, like sports supplements, equipment and facilities, monitoring technology. And this really highlights the, the desire to improve player performance and durability through our strength conditioning expertise. Number five is we have internal PBS CCS evidence of our value increasing too. Our directory illustrates impressive growth in our industry and our member driven salary survey that's been led by Ryan Stoneberg shows that the number of jobs have increased, although it's debatable how much salaries have grown at this same time. And finally, we're seeing this today, our, our PBS CCS winter meeting attendance, which highlights the number of coaches has grown from 80 in the mid 2000s to an annual 200 member participation. So we've increased that quite a bit. The second bullet point on how roles have changed is that the titles of strength and conditioning coach have evolved too. In the mid 2000s, this was the, the default title, just basically strength and conditioning coach. And at that time, it seemed accurate to describe the general work for that role that was being done. Today, titles have evolved from a general descriptor of the position to level and task customization. In an attempt to understand this more fully, one can review our directory again and note that there are a variety of titles for today's strength coach. So the historical fault, as I mentioned, has been strength and conditioning coach, but now we're seeing it being structured by level. For example, do you work in the Dominican Republic as a minor league coach, major league coach, as an assistant, as a coordinator, a director, or a senior director? It's also highlight highlighting um, working as or in certain spaces. So a specialist, a coach working in rehab as performance something, development, strength, conditioning, science, physical sports, or things like athlete development. Ultimately, the focus on specialization and development has increased, resulting in more specific title descriptors. Organizational structure and reporting. Over time, the strength coach's place in organizational structures and reporting has also changed. Early on, the structure is far more binary, predictable, and logical. The direct report was the major league strength coach. The space included other practitioners, but it did lack full inclusion of other departments. The backbone of this model was clear reporting lines and the ability to make decisions quickly. 
Today, in most organizations, departments have grown out of a siloed strength conditioning model. This has happened because organizations have increased the number of personnel or experts coming into the space, like strength coaches, athletic trainers, PTs, performance nutrition, and uh, performance psychology. This has caused the system of interaction and reporting become more complex and in some cases ambiguous. We've shifted from binary, predictable, and logical towards a flexible team of teams system, which was a term that was coined by Army General Stanley McChrystal. A team of teams approach operates as a flexible constellation of teams that comes together around specific goals. It's a problem solving based approach to drive player improvement. In most cases though, increasing the number of people involved has slowed the decision-making process, potentially decreasing the pace of actual production. In theory, there is more, more potential for athlete care, but this still has to be proven. And we should expect the structure to continue to evolve in this direction, all but one that has clearer reporting lines. And finally, job responsibilities. As many of us know, our responsibilities and expectations have changed too. There was a time when the off season actually meant time off. This was spent with time with family, leisure, recharging, and reinvention for a new season each February. And at that time, you'd go into a new season feeling energized and motivated. Today's responsibilities are different. The off season is commonly referred to, and we've heard this already, the season without the games. It can be as challenging as working in season. And certainly the pandemic hasn't helped ease these commitments. Pre-COVID, many coaches spent their off-seasons traveling all the world to visit their top or their priority players. The visits included short training sessions, assessments, and clearing, clear reporting back to front office regarding player progress. In 2020, our days are spent on Zoom calls, training players virtually, hosting or videoing education sessions like we're doing today, executing weekly player calls and check-ins, and this is leaving less time to be energized and to reinvent oneself and this process will keep going. Lastly, there's one other clear difference that I've noticed over the last few years. At one time, building robust athletes was a main responsibility and focus of strength coaches. The focus was, the focus was on programming elite running and lifting programs aimed at improving performance and durability. But today, building robust athletes attracts much less attention. Running and lifting best practices are underappreciated and viewed as, as archaic and potentially old school. The new kid on the block is skill-based acquisition and common phrases like internal and external cueing and constraint-based learning are popular language. The MVP machine by Travis Sacek is exceptional at telling these success stories. This movement has created a desire for strength coaches to spend more time in the bullpen, in the batting cage or infield sessions than in the weight room. Although this is critical, valuable and certainly necessary to player development and coach relationships, it is potentially short-sighted because it distracts from our focus on building robust athletes. Over time though, I'm excited to watch these responsibilities blur into a single direction, one that works towards a common goal, which is working together to improve baseball performance. However, as strength coaches, we should not sacrifice building robust athletes because this concept has carried us to this point. So moving on, Um, moving on to the parts of the role that have stayed the same. And on the right side, you'll see a picture. This is a picture of a linchpin. You may or may not be familiar with it. And you may be wondering, what is it and what purpose does it serve? The literal meaning of a linchpin is a locking pin used to attach a wheel to an axle. It's very practical. Used more broadly and popularized by author Seth Godin, it represents a vital component of a process or a system that holds the key parts together to improve efficiency and effectiveness. In our case, the metaphor symbolizes the key components to a strength conditioning system. Number one is lifting parameters. Strength Coach 101 teaches us that set and rep schemes and percentage-based lifting are a key foundation. The charts that we use, percentage charts, give us a general suggestion for set and rep schemes by percentage of 1RM. This concept is a foundation and has remained very, very little change. The guidelines are based on good quality science have been tested over time. And in practical terms, it's important that athletes lift loads at greater than 75% of 1RM on the major leg movements at least one time per week during the season. This is enough load to maintain and possibly gain strength in season if managed correctly. Percentage-based lifting continues to be a foundation for strength conditioning. 
Number two, ESD or energy system development. And you still have to train in all three energy systems. You have to train the ATP PC system, glycolysis, as well as longer duration activities that, that encourage oxidative system development. So you have to train under 10 seconds. You've got to train between one and three minutes and you have to train greater than three minutes. This builds tolerance, improves recovery, and is a well-rounded conditioning approach. Individually though, there will be positional differences with time spent on each, on each system. And this has to do mainly with needs of the game. Energy system development continues to be a foundation for sound strength conditioning programs. Number three is movement mastery. You have to have competence and proficiency with movement. You must move the body through a full range of motion or you'll sacrifice competence. This doesn't have to be difficult either. It could be some patterning of a simple lunge, a squat, a hinge, or balance work that's incorporated. And it has to be done daily. Movement competence, proficiency, and ultimately mastery continue to be foundations for sound strength and conditioning programs. And finally, the balance between work and rest or fitness and freshness continue to be the foundations as well. You must push athletes just beyond their current conditioning levels and then let them rest. How you balance these two determines performance and readiness. We're constantly working to have it all, but acknowledge that one sacrifices the other. The balance between work and rest or readiness continues to be a foundation for sound strength and conditioning programs. Lessons learned. Number one is expect adversity and be prepared to respond. I don't know that there's any better example than what we've experienced in 2020 with COVID. Um, we're all dealt with, uh, with really a difficult hand here and, um, and we're having to, to modify and we've done that uh, with an excellent job today, um, still hosting our winter meetings, but we have to be ready to, to respond and expect some adversity. During your career, uh, you'll make a lot of decisions about your career, but also recognizing that at some point, people would make decisions about your career for you. How you respond to the second matters the most. And remember that very few people leave the game on their own terms. So continue to evolve and develop your skills because life in baseball won't last forever. Number two is stick to your values and your standards. These are your guiding beliefs. These are, these are the, the components that guide your decisions during your day. Along the way, these will be challenged. Um, and remember that, um, that sticking to your values and your standards doesn't make you close-minded or a bad teammate. It just means that you're sticking to your values and standards and your beliefs. Number three, learn about differing viewpoints. And this is the difference between understanding and agreeing. I do believe you have to take time to understand everyone's perspective, but then it's your choice on whether you agree with that perspective moving forward. Now, certainly there are gonna be times where we don't agree with something and we have to go along with it, but as long as that doesn't sacrifice your values and standards, it's certainly worthwhile. But begin to understand the difference between understanding viewpoints and agreeing with them. An exper experiment with trying a different approach or find different ways to ask questions to get to the answers or the information that you need to make decisions. And finally, focus on the job that you have. The best way to get the job that you want is to focus on the job that you have. So focus on the job you have to get the job that you want. And remember that doing exceptional work is a requirement. You still have to be excellent at what you're doing. And the last point here on focusing on the job that, you, that you've got is, is really to, to make sure you have a mentor, have someone who can um, help guide you through some of the decisions that you're going to have to make and provide really good, um, good advice moving forward for you. Future opportunities. So the future provides both opportunities and challenges and your perception determines your approach. I'm listing these four areas because time spent learning about these is time well spent. And notice that mostly these have to do with the development of soft skills. Nick talked with our first presentation mainly about communication. Uh, and we'll hear about that a couple more times, I believe, today. So these, I think, um, are the future of what we need to be studying as, as coaches. Number one is communication, and it continues to be a key. It's the difference between what you said and what you, and what you meant. Learn to identify assumptions. Learn about clarifying expectations. Work on finding agreement with other people. William Murray, the author of the book Getting BS, gives two excellent, excellent strategies. The first is separate people from problems. 
Don't talk about people, do talk about the problem. Next is the difference between making it personal and keeping it objective. He also says to focus on your interests, not positions. That's talking about what you want, not always about what you believe. So really spend time studying about communication. Number two is perception. Learn about how others see the situation and then inventory the gap between how they see it and how you see it. Ask questions to understand that more clearly. Establish a clear understanding of what you're expected to do. What do people expect you to do? And then establish a clear understanding of what you can do. Um, we talk a lot about um, assumptions and expectations and really we have to clarify the difference between those two. An effective way to learn more about someone else's perspective is to put yourself in their shoes, which means work to understand how, other, how the other person sees it. So study perception and learn about differing viewpoints. Number three is competition. What are the skills that separate your performance as a coach? Think about this as your superpower and then go develop that skill. Competition for high level roles is increasing and it appears the number of jobs are currently disappearing, which is increasing competition. This is happening mainly for two reasons. Number one is COVID related. And number two is that the perception that coaching quality has improved. So find what distinguishes your performance from others. And finally, relationships. Where are you spending your time? Do you learn and share with others? Are you investing your time in those relationships? Do other people trust you and do you trust them? And if the answer to that is no, you have a lot of work to do. Learn to form relationships with all staff, clubhouse managers and their full staff, coaches, analytics, players, front office, and really all personnel that are working in the game. Commit to developing strong, supportive, relationships. So in summary, as I get close to time, I started talking about adding some context or providing perspective to the thoughts that I shared. I moved on to talking about advancements like the increase in strength coach value, title upgrades, changes in organizational structure reporting, and changes in our responsibilities. I talked about foundations like lifting parameters, ESD, movement mastery, and the balance between work and rest. And next, I talked about the lessons learned, like being ready for adversity, sticking to your values and your standards, learning about differing viewpoints, and focusing on the job that you currently have. And lastly, I talked about future opportunities, which mostly are soft skills, communication, perception, competition, and building strong relationships. Thank you for allowing me to, uh, to take time today to, to share my thoughts. Um, I've put my contact information on here. I'd be happy to talk to, to anybody offline. Um, and then certainly wanted to, to mention, you know, the support of my family, um, my, my three kids and, and my awesome wife, Lee, certainly couldn't um, have accomplished what I've, uh, what I've done in, in baseball without them. And um, they've continued to be sort of the North Star to, um, to my career. So thank you. Huh. Outstanding job, man. What a very thorough description of, uh, you know, from where we start in the industry to, uh, you know, climbing all the way to the top of it. Um, well done, number one. And, and uh, again, great job on the presentation. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions in the hopper. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to have you answer them uh, via typing. Great. And we're